my earliest recollection, I think, was when I was probably just arrived in secondary school, um, about you know, 11, 12 years old. Uh, I got myself into a spot of bother early on with a maths teacher uh, and found myself in a queue outside the headmaster's office to, to go and actually get, get caned. Which was still good back in those days. Uh, while I was uh, in the queue waiting, uh, there was a small bookshelf off on the side and I uh, pulled a book out of there, just a random book, and it was a small ladybird book uh, entitled Scott of the Antarctic. Uh, and I sat and sort of read that uh, and it honestly completely blew me away. Uh, and, you know, and I was just absolutely gobsmacked you know, by this epic journey that these guys had undertaken to the pole and, and obviously the tragic story of those sort of coming back. And, and from that point onwards, you know, I, I was just absolutely say, fascinated by Antarctica and the, and the journeys of the polar pioneers and wanted to go down there and, and experience it for myself. Leon, I'm actually just going to read you. I read this earlier, actually, you know, I was just be interested to hear your thoughts on it. Mm. Um, but Ernest Shackleton famously wrote it in the heart of Antarctic. Men go out into the void spaces of the world for various reasons. Some are actuated simply by love of adventure. Some have a keen thirst for scientific knowledge. And others, again, are drawn away from the trodden past by the lure of little voices, the mysterious fascination of the unknown. You've just come back with Spear 17, really, and you're now going back. What is it that is so compelling about Antarctic and why are you going back there? Yeah, I mean, um, as, as a place, you know, I absolutely love, you know, Antarctica. Um, just the, the sheer vastness, you know, of it uh, just, you know, blows me away every time. It's, um, yeah, it's, you know, within the polar community called the Great White Queen. And it's like the calling, the, the siren song of the Great White Queen. It really does sort of draw you back and... Um, yeah, and, and just the scenery, I think, is absolutely stunning. And the fact that it's it's a real raw beauty and just completely untouched by mankind, you know, it really is one of the final places on the planet that's got minimal sort of, you know, impact from mankind. And, and, and just that real sense of isolation. Strugies, these sort of ridges of um, sort of quite hard, you know, wind-carved ice uh, and snow, and uh, and it massively varies from season to season. It very much depends what's happened in the previous winter season as to how the conditions are going to be, and it's very much potluck uh, when I get down there. But if there's a lot of screw, you can really hamper progress. It's going to be a really difficult journey, you know, going for the sort of solo piece. So all the uh, expeditions I've done in the past have been, you know, as part of a team. Sure. Um, so again, I haven't done a solo uh, expedition, so I'm going to see that I think because that was a real challenge, you know, being, being on my own uh, for that amount of time. Uh, I'm obviously, always concerned about the crevasse risk uh, down there. Uh, in a team, you know, when you're sort of roped up, you know, in the high risk areas, and you've got options, you know, somebody goes in. Um, but obviously going down solo, you know, down the crevasse, if myself and the pole could go in, and that's probably one of the... packing and preparation. Um, so I'll strip them all my food, uh, do communications tests with the AD guys that are here this evening, uh, mentally at the finish line on the far side of the continent. And I'll just say to myself, the only way you'll get all of this back is by skiing a thousand miles wow. to get to it. That is the only option. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's done a, done a great job of spreading the word uh, on the expedition line, you know, so I want to thank them guys for coming up. Very good feeling, Brad. Polish! <laughs>